Um, so this talk is going to be in three parts. Um, and actually, I went through it last night with my wife and realized I put far too much information in here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut to the chase in a lot of these slides and, and skip over some of the details. Um, but you'll have access to the slides. And so if there's anything that you want to have a look at um, later on, or if you want to ask me any questions about it, send me an email afterwards. It's, oh, that, that's, that's, quite, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about malaria, um, a little bit about a system called CRISPR-Cas9, and then uh, start talking about a risk assessment for phased genetic control strategies in Africa. So I'm going to try and keep the malaria bit, I'm going to try and actually get that down to five minutes. The CRISPR-Cas9, that's, that's, that's quite complicated, so I'm probably going to spend 15 to 20 minutes on that, and then whatever time's left, I'm going to talk about the risk assessment work. Um, but it's important that you understand the CRISPR-Cas9 genetics, so you understand what's being done and what's being proposed and how we're trying to address it. Um, so, just quickly, hands up, who hasn't heard of malaria? Okay, so everybody knows what malaria is. You all know it's transmitted by female mosquitoes. Yep, okay, so I'm going to skip to the chase. Malaria currently, it used to be much more widespread than it is today. Um, in fact, including northern Australia, but it got eradicated from North Australia back in the 1960s, 1970s. And it's predominantly now an African problem. Um, so this is the incidence of malaria, a number of new cases per thousand people. Um, and the World Health uh, target is 3.3 cases per thousand. And you can see in Africa it's up to something about 250 still. It's going to get a bit smaller. So I think they're a bit bigger, you might be able to see the... Uh... So this is... Um, so I've downloaded some data for you here from the World Health Organization um, and from the World Bank, and I just just plot it up. So you can see from about 2000 to about 2017, 2018, 2019, the number of cases um, of malaria, just this tumble number, total number of new cases, is pretty constant, um, which is remarkable if you look at the rise in population at that time. So on the left hand side, there you see total population in Africa. Um, from 2000 up to about 2021, has risen from about, um, oh, it's about 700, uh, or about 70 million, to about 1.2 billion people. Um, but during that population rise, uh, there's been a sustained effort to try and um, reduce malaria and eradicate it from the continent. And that's maintained, that maintained in some cases for quite a long time. And the number of deaths, as you can see in the bottom left there, um, actually came down quite dramatically. Importantly now, though, if you look here, just can you see this little upturn here on the right-hand side of both these figures here? Um, so now, worryingly, um, cases of malaria and the number of deaths seem to be rising again. Um, and there are quite a few reasons for that. The impact of COVID on the existing health system is partly to blame for some of that, um, people believe. But also what is happening is that many of the mosquitoes and the uh, the malaria parasite itself are becoming resistant to the drugs and the chemicals that have been used to control them previously. So there's this growing resistance in both the mosquito populations and in the parasite populations that cause the, the parasite plasmodium that causes malaria um, and become more and more resistant to the, to the drugs and the chemicals we use to control them. So there's a big push now um, through the World Health Organization uh, and funded largely by the Gates Foundation and others um, to find new ways to control malaria in Africa. Okay, so this, what I want to talk about now is one of these new ways that have been, uh, uh, people are looking at quite closely. Are there any questions on that yet? Um, and I perhaps I should also mention that, so these deaths now, what we're about, around about 600,000 deaths a year. And I was saying to John earlier, 80% of those are children under five. So most of the deaths in Africa are children under five years. Um, so it's about 400,000 deaths a year, or roughly about 1,000 kids a day. So it's quite, you know, there's quite a large imperative to do something about this disease. Okay, so what I'll talk about now um, is a thing called this CRISPR-Cas revolution. Who's heard of CRISPR-Cas systems before? Okay, a few, three or four, okay. Um, that's good. So... In the last 
60, 70 odd years, we've been developing ways to um, sequence genes in different organisms to find out what the gene sequences are. And over that period of time, scientists start to discover um, these sequences of, uh, repeat sequences of genes. Uh, and you can see here, the figure here is this GATTC um, and then GATTC, so it's a palindrome. Red at the top here is the same here going backwards, so here forward, same going here backwards. Um, a number of scientists discovered this sort of funny sequence, this re sequence repeated, separated by these unique sequences. And they started to find it in lots of different bacteria and archaea uh, genome sequences. And this similarity across lots of different species really sparked people's curiosity. It's like, that's odd. Why are we seeing these strange repeat sequences um, separated by these unique sequences? And more importantly, people started to look at these unique sequences and realize that they matched the sequences of DNA in viruses that attack bacteria. So viruses attack bacteria called bacteriophages, and they began to realize that these unique sequences, which are all different, match different bacteriophages, um, but were separated by these same sequences. Um, and that really sparked people's curiosity, like, what's going on here? This is, this is curious. Um, and then in the, in the early 2000s, um, the Spanish researchers said, look, this, you know, this might be an immune system for bacteria. This might be a way bacteria defend themselves against viruses. We thought, well, that's quite interesting. And the same chap named these sequences here, the clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats, okay, or CRISPR for short. Um, so they're clustered, they occur in the same part of the genome. They, they're regular, but interspersed. So they're interspersed by these unique sequences, but they occur regularly after that. They're palindromic, and the sequence goes from GATTC, is read back, GATTC the same, um, and they're repeated through the genome. That sequence I just showed you there is known as the CRISPR array. And that's what we're showing here on the right-hand side. And over time, um, through various discoveries and various experiments, people realize that upstream of this CRISPR array, so further up here, by prime end of the, of the genome, they noticed a number of other quite similar genetic sequences um, that were coding for, for, for three really important sets of, of uh, genes and proteins. So these three things here, the very important parts of this whole system. This thing here called track RNA. So that's transactivating CRISPR RNA. So RNA is single strand of DNA. Um, this thing here, Cas9, which is a protein, is an endonuclease. So endonucleases are proteins that cut, they make double, they cut DNA. You can create double-stranded breaks in DNA. And this thing here, the pre-CRISPR RNA. So what was happening, people were realizing is that when this sequence is transcribed, when it can, uh, these three components are created and they form these complexes. So you can see here what happens is the track RNA complex with this pre-CRISPR RNA, which is cut up into this unique sequence. So you have this, this long sequence here is cut up into the unique sequence, which maps the bacteriophage and the CRISPR sequence. And then again, another cut, unique sequence and the CRISPR sequence. That complex is with the track RNA, and those two things become form uh, with Cas9, which is an endonuclease, and they create these complexes, which form in the cell of the bacteria. And it was discovered that these three things here act as an immune system for bacteria. Okay, and how they do that? Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit here on this figure for you. So this is that same CRISPR locus I was showing you previously. It has the CRISPR array here, and then it has these endonucleases, these genes which precede it, and the track, track RNA genes too. So when a virus comes in, and here a bacteriophage, um, they survive. What they do is they inject their DNA into the bacteria, and they use the bacteria's own genetic replication system to, re to replicate their DNA. So that's how bacteriophages survive. Um, now, in doing that, it replicates their DNA, it eventually destroys the bacterial cell, and the virus is then released further on into the environment. Um, so what happens is when a bacteriophage virus infects the bacteria, the bacteria responds through these uh, endonucleases here. CSN1 now is actually renamed Cas9, so that's what that is. 
Um, this sequence of genes is activated. They recognize the viral DNA and they cut the viral DNA up. Okay? And then a unique part of that viral DNA is stored into this CRISPR array. And they do that every time they encourage or encounter a new virus, it cuts a new little piece of that DNA and stores it in its own genome next to the CRISPR. Okay, so that's what was giving rise to this pattern of these CRISPR sequences separated by these unique sequences which match different viruses. Okay. So it's like the, vi the bacteria is creating a memory of what's infected it previously. So if it survives the infection, which I mean this, it may not, if it does, it has this sort of memory of what's infected it previously by this little unique sequence of DNA from the virus. So if it's actually invaded again by the same virus, what happens is that this whole system is reactivated, activates again, and these, those three important components I talked about are created, the track RNA, the CRISPR sequence, which matches, and the Cas9. And what it does is they form this complex which looks around and it, if, if it looks for that same piece of DNA that it recognized previously, and if it finds it, if it finds that same piece of DNA, it locks on and this Cas9, the endonuclease, cuts the DNA. So what it does is it, it says, okay, I have a memory of something I was infected previously. I'll have these CRISPR RNAs and this Cas9 complex floating around. And if I see, if I have a match again, if I see this strange DNA in my system, which matches something I've seen previously, I'm going to lock on, I'm going to cut it. Okay, so it's like a, it's, it's effectively an immune system. It's like a, like a vaccine for bacteria, if you like, against invading viruses. Now, the discovery of this system, it's taking you know, 20 or 30 years, um, and it's where, it's where it's landed now and has been used is, is something that's become really, really important. Uh, so this is, this is the natural system here. So we have this, the track RNA talked about previously, we have the CRISPR RNA, and see these things, they pair up. This is the Cas, this is the Cas9, the big pink purple blob. Um, this is the target DNA, and it, the CRISPR RNA it matches, it finds a comp complementary sequence, a match, and the Cas9 RNA makes this little cut, which is the scissors here. An important discovery, so when people realize this is what bacteria were doing in nature, this was a natural system, um, they realized that they could take this track RNA system and the CRISPR RNA system and they could join them and form what's called a single guide RNA. And that's what this thing is here, sgRNA. So they synthesized the same system by simply joining this one system here, engineering this one system here, um, and still complexing with the Cas9. So now they could artificially create this system. And more importantly, the single guide RNA they could program it to target any sequence of DNA. Because this CRISPR sequence here is very short, it's only about 20 base pairs. So you can sequence now 20 base pairs very, very easily. And if you know the gene sequence that you want to interfere with, all you need to do is, oh, did I press something? I did. All you need to do is design a guide RNA which matches the sequence you're interested in, okay, put it, into this single guide RNA system, complex it with Cas9, and you have a way, you basically have a set of molecular scissors. Now, we've known how to make double-stranded breaks in DNA, and we've known how to do that for many, many years, but the process of achieving that takes weeks to months, sometimes years of experimentation. This system has reduced the time required to do that down to days, hours in some cases, and it's very, very precise. Um, so this system, this synthetic CRISPR-Cas9 system for gene editing uh, was developed over, over literally over the last 10 or 15 years and two of the most important scientists involved in it, uh, Emmanuel Carpentier and Jennifer Doudna, were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020 for the system. Okay. So that's a very important and massive step to breakthrough in genetic engineering. That's why it's, it creates quite a stir and, and still is now. Um, because it can be used for a whole range of different of different applications. And so we're going to move on now to talk about the application in controlling malaria. Uh, is there any questions on that before we move on? No, it's all clear as mud? Yeah? <laughs> okay. So this is quite an important slide, so I'm going to, I am going to spend some time on this slide. So this is the system I, was, I just explained to you previously. 
So this is the Cas9 uh, anginuclease, the protein that cuts DNA, now in blue. Um, we have this, the guide RNA here in green. We have this complementary sequence, which matches. This is the genomic DNA. We have to see the match here, genomic matches. Um, and then the cut will occur here, this cleavage site here. What happens um, ordinarily when double-stranded DNA breaks occur in eukaryote organisms, so in diploid eukaryote organisms, or sexually reproducing organisms, they have two pairs of chromosomes. Uh, so I have a pair of chromosomes, two sets of genes and pairs of chromosomes. What normally happens is when you cut one of those chromosomes, the cell will try to repair that cut. Okay, and it does it in two ways. Actually, there's three, but the, the main two ways that it does it are it will, first up, it might try and just basically take the two ends of cut DNA and just sort of try and bolt them back together. Okay, and it sometimes puts uh, different base pairs in there. Sometimes it cuts a little bit out. But what happens is you end up with this repair, but the repair is not exactly the same as the gene sequence that was there previously. It tends to be error prone. The other way, the more common way to do it, is that the cell says, okay, I've got a cut here in one of my chromosomes. I'm gonna look over to this, the homologous chromosome, so the chromosome that, the, that matches that chromosome. So um, I'm gonna look over to that. I'm gonna look where, what the genes are in that chromosome. I'm gonna use that as a repair template. So it looks across the homologous chromosome and says, okay, these are the genes that were there. I'm gonna copy them and paste them back into this cut. And that's called homology directed repair. Now, what scientists realized is that they could take advantage of this system by having this CRISPR-Cas9 system here, but on either side of it, so if they have a target, so say they want to cut a gene um, in the chromosome, they, they know what the gene is, and they know what the genes are and the, and the base pair sequence either side of that gene. So what they do is they deliberately develop these homology arms, so these are the sections here in red, homology arm, HA left and HA right, that's what HA stands for here. Um, and what they do is they basically, they say, okay, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna copy these genes here on the left, I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna create my CRISPR-Cas system in here, and then I'm gonna copy the genes to the right. And what they're trying to do is encourage homologous directed repair. So when this CRISPR-Cas9 system cuts double-stranded DNA, when the gene looks to the homologous repair where the cut is, it goes, oh, I see all this similarity either side of this CRISPR-Cas9 here, and it copies the entire sequence back into the cut. Okay, so not only does it cut the DNA, but it copies the system that cut it onto the homologous chromosome. So what you end up with is two copies of this system in the organism now. Um, so it's like a cut and copy system. So Keswick Cas9 comes in and cuts one of the strands. The cell looks to the other strand, sees the homology, and copies everything between the homologous arms, including the genes, the CRISPR Cas9 system that's able to make the cut next time around. Does that make sense? So it, the basic notion, the intuition, is a cut and copy system. Now, why is that important? Well, that's really important because if you can create this cut and copy system in the germ lines of organisms, so for example, uh, when eggs are being produced in females or when sperms are being, being produced in males, what you can do is you can cheat Mendel's law of inheritance. Right, so Mendel's law is where you go back to your, your high school biology, is you've got a roughly 50% chance of inheriting any gene. Okay, what this system does, and this is what's trying to show on the left hand side, is it cheats that system. Because when, for example, as spermatogenesis, when sperm is being, being produced, if you activate this cut and copy system, um, you can take every single cell will have in the zygote uh, will have a copy of this gene. So when, when the, say this, with the, uh, if the genetically modified sperm meets the egg and at meiosis, when, the, when after fertilization, meiosis and cell divides, if you create, if you in, instigate this system, every cell will have this CRISPR-Cas9 system embedded within it. Okay, so effectively you can cheat Mendel's laws and you can ensure that virtually all the offspring receive this genetic construct. 
Okay, so this is what the little figure here is trying to show you on the, the bottom left hand side. So normally, under Mendelian inheritance, if you created here a genetically modified mosquito, when it would mate with a wild type, the genetic modification ordinarily would have a 50% chance of being inherited by 50% of the offspring, um, and, then, and then inherited by only 50% of its offspring, and then inherited only by 50% of its offspring again. So each generation, only half of the sub mosquitoes are, are getting this construct. And over time, unless you keep swamping the population with this genetic construct, keep reintroducing it, over time that introduction will just fade out. It will just get swamped by, by the, you know, the natural genome. And it'll, the process called genetic drift will eventually be lost. With the gene drive system here, with the system, this cut and copy system, if you, once you introduce it, and this cut and copy occurs in the germline, occurs at fertilization, um, you can guarantee that almost every single individual will get a copy of this genetic construct. Okay, and that's what gene drive is. Um, so often also called homing. Um, so what it means is that you know, rather than just 50% of the offspring get it, every single one of the offspring get it. So when they mate, everyone, every single one of their offspring get it. And when they mate, all of their offspring get it. So you can drive a genetic construct through a population uh, very, very quickly. Um, in this case here, this is a very simple modeling suggesting that in mosquitoes, you can drive it, you can seed that population, say with just a few individuals and over 10 generations, which for a mosquito, 10 generations of mosquitoes, roughly a year, you can ensure that every single member of that population has that, has that construct. So can you see the, how powerful this technique is, but also how potentially dangerous it is, because once it's it, once you let it go, you know, it tends to run off like wildfire. Um, now there are ways of controlling it. It's very, you know, this this is a very simple uh, representation of what is a much more complex system, and there are ways of controlling this spread. Um, but nonetheless, the notion is that it is designed to spread through populations um, with a very small being seeded with a very small initial uh, number. Um, so this is this slide here. What this slide here is showing you is first proof of principle of this CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system in Anopheles gambi. Now Anopheles gambi is one of the main vectors of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. And what this, what this gene drive is doing here is it's trying to disrupt a gene called double sex, DSXF, is double sex female. And this gene is what determines in mosquitoes, in fact many other insects, um, it determines male and female. It governs whether you become a male or female. Um, if you get two copies, two functional copies of this gene, um, sorry, if you get one functional copy of this gene, um, you become a female in mosquitoes. And if you don't get any, if you don't get any of this DSXF version, you become male. If you disrupt this gene um, and you disrupt it so that the mosquito inherits two disrupted versions of it, then what you end up with are genotypic females that have phenotypic male properties. So they're genetically female, but they look like male mosquitoes. And this is what this slide here is showing. Um, so here, these are, the, uh, so these are the male mosquitoes here, and these are the female mosquitoes here. But these females here, so you, see, you see it says DSXF minus minus. That means both copies of this gene in this mosquito have been disrupted by using this CRISPR-Cas9 system. And these mosquitoes show clasping features, inverted here, they're incorrect, but they show their clasping features, which are male clasping features, and its proboscis, its antenna, look like male antennas and male proboscis. So these mosquitoes are no longer are able to bite. Um, so they're female mosquitoes that can no longer bite, because they, they, and so they will eventually die because that's how they, they feed through blood meals. But they can no longer bite because the proboscis looks like a male proboscis, and male mosquitoes don't bite, they feed on things like pollen. Um, and so what happens is, if you can, this graph here is showing you the results of that theoretical CRISPR-Cas9 system being introduced. Um, so here this experiment was about 600 mosquitoes in a cage. Uh, they introduced about 25% uh, frequency, so this would be a couple of hundred of these transgenic mosquitoes. And the gray lines are model predictions, how quickly this the CRISPR-Cas9 system would spread through the population. The, the black line is the mean of those gray lines, 
And the blue and red lines are the actual experiment they ran when they ran, when they ran the experiment. And you can see the frequency of these double sex of these individuals that have both copies of this double sex F interrupted has increased um, to almost 100% within about 12 generations. And here's the number of eggs that have been produced in that cage population. You can see the same thing, that collapses very, very quickly. Because um, these mosquitoes, not only can they bite, they're also, they're also become, they don't have any eggs anymore. So they're, although they're female, they can no longer produce eggs, and they can't bite, they can no longer feed. And so the egg output drops dramatically as well. Um, so now you think, okay, so this potentially is a system by which if I introduce this into the wild, I could take all these genetic females and make them act like male mosquitoes and they'll stop producing eggs and they'll stop biting people and over time the population will crash and malaria could be potentially cured by it. So that's the whole notion of the gene drive to try and um, potentially uh, cure malaria. Um, there's one other part of the story here I just want to talk to you about quickly is that whole system has been somewhat supercharged as well. Um, so here on the left hand side is the CRISPR-Cas9 system, this little red thing here, uh, which is targeting that double sex gene, and that's on an autosome. Okay, so that's on, it's not on the sex chromosome, it's on one of the other uh, chromosomes of the mosquitoes. And when the transgenic female mates with a wild type male, uh, you get this homing that occurs, you get this gene drive that occurs, and all her eggs of the female end up with one copy of this genetic construct, which is interfering with double sex. So that's the process we just described. Um, there's another interesting feature of, um, uh, of mosquitoes, and sorry, so, so every one of these mosquitoes gets, or almost every one of the mosquitoes gets this construct, but see the sex ratio is still about 50-50, so there's still half male, half female, um, at least genetically. You know, phenotypically, as soon as they get two copies, they're going to be, you know, the, the girls are going to look like boys, but genot genotypically, they're still half males, half females. There's another interesting feature about mosquitoes is that on their X chromosome, there's a series of what they call inverted transcribed repeats, ITRs. And these little gene sequences, uh, there's about 250 copies of them, which um, scientists have found another way to cut these things using a different endonuclease. Um, but they can express that endonuclease at uh, spermatogenesis. And what they can do is they can cut the X chromosome uh, in, this, in, in, in sperm in male sperm. So male mosquitoes that have this, well, it's called an IP pole construct, an X shredding construct, males which have this construct only produce Y bearing sperm. Okay, so what that means is that if they only produce Y bearing sperm, all their offspring will be boys. Okay, so there's no, there's no X chromosomes being transmitted to the X. Okay, so what, signed, what, what they've done now, and I'll show you this, the type of have done this, is they've taken this gene drive targeting double sex and they couple it to this system which creates only wide bearing sperm and effectively supercharged this gene drive. Um, so what happens is it's spreading through the population through homing through gene drive, but not only is it spreading through that, 95% of the offspring are actually males as well at the same time. And the few that are left, the few females that are left are increasingly becoming like males over time. So the end result of, of this combined system is that they can now um, they can now end up with a much much quicker penetration and a much quicker crashing of these populations. So not only are they making these females, any females that survive over time are becoming acting like males. Most of them aren't females to start with. Most of them are male offspring. So the whole system is kind of is, is being like supercharged, and so you can end up crashing the population with a much lower initial seed population. So in that previous graph, I think it was about 250 mosquitoes in a, in a group of 600. And then over time, in the course of about a year, all of them crashed. This was um, about a tenth of that. It's like 25 mosquitoes in a population of 600. And over the same time frame, the whole population crashed. So it's a much more powerful system. Okay, so. That's the science, the theory behind how you might try and control malaria using genetic engineering, using a state-of-the-art 
that this gene drives um, CRISPR-Cas9 system and another system, an X, an X shredding system. Uh, what I want to tell you now is, okay, so what's I got to do with us? Why are we involved in this? Why are we giving this talk? Um, so that system is being developed and the system is being implemented by a group called Targ Malaria from Imperial College London uh, with funding from the Gates Foundation. Um, as you can imagine, that system is potentially very powerful, but also then potentially quite dangerous. If something went wrong and you release that system in the wild, it may be difficult to control that system and record it. So what's happening is um, people aren't just going ahead and just releasing that system in the wild. It's, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's this there's sort of a, uh, what's known as a phased release strategy. And that's this slide here is showing you that. The top here is the World Health Organization's recommended approach for doing this kind of technology and using this kind of technology. Um, so they recommend small-scale laboratory studies, followed by large-scale population studies, um, followed by physically or ecologically confined field trials. So for example, that might be a field trial on an island somewhere in the middle of the ocean, a long way from anywhere else. Um, and then onto stage open field releases and post-implementation surveillance. So that's the four phases that the World Health Organization recommends any organization, organization goes through when using this technology. Here on the left-hand side are the stages that Tide Malaria are using through these different phases. So this is like kind of like a double safety approach, if you like. This fir the first phases are about doing it carefully in a controlled manner. Um, then Tide Malaria is adding onto that a second, if you like, safety approach where they're using different stages, different genetic constructs. So the first one, stage one, all these mosquitoes are sterile. Okay, so these mosquitoes using that same X shredding technology I was talking about, um, it's, it produces not only are these mosquitoes producing Y bearing sperm, but what's happening is, is that these, this, this, ended, this protein that's cutting the X chromosome uh, is, is there's some X, there's excess protein that's left over in the zygote. So it's cutting the X chromosome from the mother as well. So when, this, when the sperm goes into the zygote, sperm fertilizes the egg, there's excess protein left and it's cutting the X chromosome from the mum. So what that means is that these mosquitoes are totally sterile. Okay, so they, they, that's the first stage that they developed. The second stage that they developed is they denurtured that protein a little bit so it doesn't last as long. So that it doesn't, there is no excess protein left in the zygote. So these are, these are just Y-bearing sperm mosquitoes. Okay, so these are male bias mosquitoes. So the construct can be inherited, they're not sterile, but it's only inherited in Mendelian fashion, so only half the offspring will get it. And the third stage, is this male bias plus female fertility, which is the supercharged CRISPR-Cas9 system I just described to you. Okay, so you can imagine now, so think through these stages, you have sterile mosquitoes, they're transgenic but they're sterile so they don't pass the construct on. Second stage, the male biting mosquitoes, they pass the genetic construct on but only to half their offspring and 95% of those offspring are gonna be males. And then the third stage is this CRISPR-Cas9 uh, and male biasing system, which is designed to drive for the population. So it's like a three-stage process. I won't go through these boxes now, but these are the different, these references here show you each of these stages that have been done and how far they've got through these, the World Health Organization. So the, that last stage I showed you uh, only three years ago, that was published and shown to work in the, in the, in the uh, laboratory, and I showed you those, some of those results there previously. We have been asked to do um, an independent assessment of the risks of releasing this technology in Africa. Um, and so this first stage, we did two risk assessments for that first stage uh, back in 2015, 2018, and they're on the web, they're publicly available if you wanna, if you wanna have a look at those. Um, and we did them ahead of a field trial of these transgenic stale mosquitoes that occurred in 2019 in Burkina Faso. So in 2019, July 2019, for the first time ever, transgenic mosquitoes were released in Africa. Um, and they were these sterile mosquitoes. And the aim being there was to measure how long the mosquitoes, how far they went, how long they lived for, how successful they were at mating, and to gather some data about their behavior. And then last year, the results of that field trial were published. And I'll show you some of those results uh, in a second. This stage two now, um, we are literally, uh, literally doing the final comments on the report for this stage two of this, which is uh, ahead of a planned field trial of these male bias mosquitoes. So we're not sure when that will occur, it's planned maybe occur in a few years time. Um, we're just finishing our third risk assessment on this. And the stage three, 
Well, we don't really know what the timeline is yet for when that may be released and when that may be ready. So what I want to do with the time left, for about another uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, is talk about some of the results from this risk assessment work that we've been doing. Um, but this is probably good. To, is there any probably good time for a quick break before we get into some maths and stats and some fun stuff? But are there any questions on on the technology or this sort of phase release strategy? Is that is that quite clear? Yeah. Okay. So where do we start with the risk assessment? Well, the first thing um, that we really like to insist upon is um, that you go to the community and you ask the community, "What do you think? Yeah. Do you think this technology is a good idea?" Are you worried about this technology? What is it that worries you about this technology? What do you think this technology may threaten? Um, so Target Malaria um, done a really good job of what was called the sort of stakeholder engagement side. So they go out to the community, they go out to the villages where these field trials are being proposed and they ask them, you know, what do they think about this? And that's actually, um, if you can imagine going into, uh, into Africa, into sub-Saharan Africa and trying to explain to people the kind of technology I've just explained to you in a language where they may not even have a word for gene drive. Like the local dialect may not even have a word for some of this stuff. So it's quite a challenging task, challenging communication task to try and ex you know, get this notion across of what this technology is. So they've been working really hard to, to, to do that and ask the community, you know, what is it you think may go wrong? Um, so these are some of the, uh, from, this is from the first and second risk assessment, so these are some of the responses they got when they talked about releasing these sterile mosquitoes into the field. Um, and what strikes me when I read this actually is that, you know, I, I sometimes have this perception of, you know, this kind of third world village in sub-Saharan Africa that people aren't, you know, are not really that smart, and they're, you know, they're farmers. But actually some of these questions are incredibly insightful. Well, they, you know, they, they uh, uh, for example here, um, could other diseases emerge from the decrease of mosquitoes? So they're thinking, well, if you take mosquitoes out of the system, or well, take this species of mosquito out of the system, what else? Will something else replace it? Will something else fill that ecological niche, that gap? And if that has a, you know, also vexes disease, will I get sick from something else? Um, uh, if, there's, if, if the mosquitoes aren't completely sterile, what, you know, what if this construct fails? What, you know, it works in the laboratory, but when you put it in the field, maybe it doesn't work quite so well. Um, what happens then to that, you know, that the, you've got this genetic mosquito flying around and it's fertile all of a sudden? So those sort of questions, questions here about, okay, you've, you've messed around with the genome of these mosquitoes. Mosquitoes transmit a number of different pathogens, not just malaria. Will it change how they just transmit those other pathogens? Um, so these are quite insightful questions coming from these communities about some of, some of this technology. If you look through the scientific literature, um, you see quite similar concerns being expressed by scientists. About, okay, so these are things that might go wrong with this technology. I won't go through them all now, um, but you know, there's, if you're interested in the reference at the end, you can, you can read some of these concerns that people talked about saying, well, these are things that might go wrong if we were to use this technology uh, in, in Africa. Now, this, this whole process of trying to figure out, okay, what might go wrong with the system is called hassle identification. It's the first stage of the risk assessment. So that's been happening now over time as people think about it. Risk assessment as a discipline, as a concept, usually looks back in time. So it usually looks back and says, okay, we did all these things, and these are the number of times these things went wrong, and so therefore I can work out how often this thing is, this is to go wrong, and when it does go wrong, how many people it hurts or what impacts it has. So it's usually a retrospective exercise. Um, with the new technology, where you have no operating experience, you don't have that. You don't have that. Uh, you can't use those, te those techniques. You can't look back in time. You can't look at failure rates and figure out how often something's going to change or what the effect of a new risk management might be. So with the new technology, uh, risk assessment always begins with this conceptual model. And these the, those hazards that I was talking about previously are behind those. Are will be a, a model in someone's head about, okay, if this happens and this might happen and this might happen, the building conceptual model of cause and effect in their mind. Okay, and we all do this with any new technology, any new proposition. We all, we all build these conceptual models. And those conceptual models are used and feed our qualitative risk predictions. So if we think about a new technology and we, oh, yeah, this might may go wrong, we think, oh, no, that might be okay, I can live with that. Or no, I'm really worried about that. Um, those qualitative risk predictions that are high, medium, low, negligible, um, are based on these conceptual models. 
We um, espouse and encourage probabilistic risk assessment. And the way we do that really is we take, we start with these conceptual models and we use a process known as elicitation to translate those experts' beliefs or the community's beliefs into uh, mathematical expressions, um, either probability distributions or mathematical models or statistical models. And we build these, these process-based models, statistical models, and I'll share a couple of examples of very quickly. And these things called qualitative mathematical models, um, which I, I don't have time to show you, but they're, they're, they're quite fun things too, um, which make quantitative risk predictions in the case of the process-based and statistical models. And these qualitative mathematical models make predictions about direction of change, but not magnitude. Um, and we use these and we compare these. The aim being is that we compare these predictions with the outcomes. And then we take that information and we feed that information back into our modeling process and back into our conceptual models. So that feedback loop there is very, very important. Um, for those of you who know any statistics, um, we use a technique called Bayes' theorem to do that. That's the formal way of doing it, but I won't, I won't go into the details of that. But the important thing to know is that this is effectively the scientific method. Okay, we make a prediction, in this case a risk prediction, we take an observation and we compare that observation to our prediction and we feed that back into our modeling process. Okay, so that's the, the basic approach. Um, the way we start that is with these cause and effect chains. Um, and we do that a, in risk assessment, that has a term called problem formulation. So this is a problem formulation for a change in vectoral capacity. So vectoral capacity is the capacity for an organism to vector a disease. So how likely or how well do mosquitoes vector malaria? Um, and so what this graph here is telling you is, do we start with a female mosquitoes um, and we there's transgenesis or transgenic um, we postulate we suspect and that's what this little hypothetical linkage is here we suspect that that might have an influence on the mosquitoes microbiome or the mosquitoes transcriptome the transcriptome is this sort of protein signature through, um, through transcription and the microbiome is it's you know, the, the microbiota that is in this gut and through its body um, this we're, sus we're suspicious that, that might be changed in transgenic mosquitoes that might be different from wild type mosquitoes we know from a limited amount of data, which is what this little dashed black arrow is here, that the microbiome in particular changes mosquitoes' innate immune system. So we know there's a few studies now starting to show that the mosquito microbiome influences its ability to transmit different pathogens. So if transgenic mosquitoes have a different microbiome, that might change their ability to transmit different diseases. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the notion there. And we know there's a bunch of parameters associated with vectoral capacity, which if we model them, model changes in those, we know from the modeling, well-established modeling, that will change the ability to transmit uh, different diseases. And that's what this little blue uh, linkage is here. And that could lead to an increase in mortality or morbidity in human populations or livestock populations. So that cause and effect chain is the initial problem formulation of a risk assessment, and then these different arrows here between them give you an indication of sort of how certain we are, how much information. Is it just, you know, are we just speculating or we have, you know, we have a few studies or this is a well-established link. Um, and importantly also, what we try and do with these diagrams is say, okay, what would I measure in this event chain? Where would I intervene? So where can I get the best data in the safest, most cost-effective manner for me to, to break this chain and to say with some confidence that this isn't going to happen. Okay, so that's another important role that they play. So I'll, tell you, I'll show you a little example now of the work we've done for, um, for vectoral capacity. So I don't want you to freak out with the, the, the equations. They, they freak me out too, by the way, if, it's, if you're interested. But, um, but through COVID, who've heard of, um, who's heard of r naught? Did anyone hear about r naught through COVID? Yeah, do you know what r naught is? It's like it's, uh, it's a measure of how quickly a disease will spread. Um, so it's, it's a long-term average of the number of, of infection case, infections created by a new infection. So for every infection that's created, how many new infections can we expect from that person? Um, so in COVID, the equation to R0 needs to be greater than one. If R0 is greater than one, that means the disease is gonna spread. Okay, so every time I get infected, if I infect more than one other in person in this room, and they're gonna infect more than one other in person in this room, then you can see the disease spreads. And the higher R0 is, the faster the disease spread. So the height of the COVID pandemic, I think R0 estimates around about four or something, which means for every one person who got infected, they were going to infect four other people. So you can see it kind of, it's, it spreads like wildfire. 
When you have two organisms involved, so malaria, there's a mosquito population and human population, the, this equation is the equation for R0. And the bits in red are the bits about the mosquitoes, and the bits in black, uh, ex, ex, <laughs> apart from the exponent there, but the parameters in black are about the human population. And this is a well-established uh, equation that's been worked on for many, many years, since the 1950s and 1960s, it's shown to be a good way of measuring R0 for, uh, not just for malaria and mosquitoes, but for any pathogen which has a, a vector life stage, so humans and an insect. Um, and the, the parameters here are things like how often you get bitten, so that's a daily biting rate here, it's A, how efficient the, path the pathogen transmits from mosquito to human, that's B. So if, if, I, if I get bitten by an infected mosquito, do I always get the pathogen? Is it 100% or is it like an 80% chance to get the pathogen? Or maybe I only get the pathogen 20% of the time. Um, and then there's the same transmission efficiency from humans to mosquito. So an infected human gets bitten by a mosquito, how likely is a mosquito to catch a pathogen? That's, that's the parameter C. The parameter U here is how quickly mosquitoes die. So if infected mosquitoes die really quickly, then that diminishes the chances of this disease spreading. So that's why here U is down here, it's, 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 it's in the, uh, it's one the parameter in the denominator. And this parameter here, TE, is what's known as the extrinsic incubation period. And that's the time it takes for the pathogen to complete its life cycle in the mosquito. So there's a certain number of days that the pathogen needs to spend the mosquito before it's ready to infect the next human. Okay, and if the mosquito dies, during that time period, and it doesn't spread malaria. Okay, so that's why you have this exponent minus ut in the equation. Anyway, the important point is that we can look at these parameters in the mosquitoes in the laboratory and see whether they die quicker, whether they bite differently, or whether they transmit the, the vector differently. So we can look for these changes um, in the laboratory and say, okay, do we think, uh, based on this laboratory data, these mosquitoes are more likely to transmit the disease? We start that process through, and this is the elicitation I was talking about earlier. So we have this conceptual model. Um, we have an understanding of how the disease transmission is done. We start by asking experts about these parameters. So here, this is the parameter of daily probability of mortality. Um, and we say to experts, tell us what you think about transmitting mosquitoes. You know, how likely do you think they are to die each day? Um, and this expert, the conference expert here is, well, you know, about 10 to 50% of the mosquitoes die each day, roughly. That's, that's roughly there. there. Um, their gauge. And we say, well, how certain are you about that? And we ask them uh, in a very structured way what their uncertainty is about that parameter mu in that previous equation. And this is the result of one of those elicitations. And what this says here is that this expert thinks there's only a one in five chance, so 19 over 20, there's only one in five chance that the daily mortality rate is higher than 0.25. So I think 0.25, yeah, that's a pretty high mortality rate. I only think there's a 5% chance it's going to be up there. And conversely, this expert thought there's only a 1 in 20 chance the mortality below is about uh, 5% each day. So that's 0 0.05 here. Um, so what we're trying to do there is get some understanding of how certain or uncertain the experts are about these parameters in this case. And then we can run, we gather all that information, we ask them about the wild type mosquitoes, we ask them about genetic mosquitoes, and then we can compare the two through those models. Um, and this is what this results here is showing. Now, this is for malaria here, falciparum, and for two other pathogens that mosquitoes transmit. And this is really the ratio, it's the log ratio of those two equations of log R0 I showed you previously. But allow for all this uncertainty in these different parameters. Now, what this uh, result show that if, if this value was zero, that would mean there'd be no difference between the transgenic mosquitoes and the wild type mosquitoes in their ability to transmit these pathogens. And if, if the area to the left of that these curves is bigger than the area to the right, then that means the experts believe the transgenic mosquitoes are less able to transmit the pathogens than others. And conversely, if the area to the right were higher than the area to the left, that means the transgenic mosquitoes would be more likely to transmit the pathogens. So this is the kind of modeling we do, accounting for this uncertainty, and then we aim to compare these models to the outcomes um, of experiments in the, in, the, in the lab. And we've only been able to do that so far for things like death rate in the field. Um, if I get time, I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, I just want to talk about one more, uh, another example here, um, where we've been, so we can talk about the field release that occurred in July 2019. This, again, don't get freaked out too much by the equations, but this is a, a way to model um, the release of an organism. Um, and here the organism 
is the mosquitoes and they can diffuse, so they can move randomly from a release point. They can, they can evac, they can move to it in a direction, in this case, attraction to swarm sites, um, and they can react, and here the reaction term is just death. Because these are sterile mosquitoes, there's no birth term in this model, right? So there's no, there's no new mosquitoes being created in this model. They're being released, they're spreading randomly, they're flying to certain places they want to go to, in this case, swarm sites, and they're dying. So it's quite a simple model, and it has these parameters here in blue, um, which is the mosquito daily mortality rate, which we saw earlier, uh, how strong this attraction to swarm sites is, this is a parameter alpha, uh, how that strength of attraction to swarm site decays with distance, that's, that's this parameter here, theta, uh, sigma, sorry, and then the diffusion coefficient delta here. And again, we're uncertain about all these things. So we know, this is a, we know these models are pretty good um, as a general representation, but we're uncertain about these parameters. So we do that same elicitation approach with experts. We ask them, well, what do you think? Express your uncertainty. We run these models with that externity in them, and this is the kind of output we get. Um, so these little gray lines are all the different models. So we take that model, we run it like a million times. And each time we take a different random set, we take a different draw from those different parameters. We say, okay, this expert had this distribution. And so we take from that, we, we take a random realization of the distribution, which reflects our uncertainty. We put it in the model. We do that a million times, each time drawing these different samples. Um, it's called Monte Carlo simulation. And that ends up, the model then has all these different uh, predictions, which reflect that uncertainty. And then the mean of all those different predictions are these red lines here, and the median is this blue line here. So what we're saying is, you now we think there was a 50% chance that when you release these transgenic mosquitoes in the field, they'd last yeah, probably about 13 days, um, somewhere between about 11 and 13 days. We were fairly certain there were going to be no mosquitoes left. And that was the model predictions that we made back in 2019. This is what happened in reality. So this field trial took place, so we made this prediction in 2018. The field trial took place in July 2019, um, and they released 5,000, actually it's about 6,000 transient mosquitoes, and they released about a similar number of wild-type mosquitoes as a control. And these mosquitoes have fluorescent dust on them, so they take them, they put this fluorescent dust on them, they release them in the environment, and they go back each day and they recapture them. They recapture mosquitoes, and they go, okay, yep, we've seen this one fluoresces, so this is one of the ones we released back you know, for the day before yesterday or, the day, or two days ago, depending on when they're sampling. And so this is the number of recaptures here, and this is the day of recapture. And you see the wild type ones here, the control are in orange, and the transgenic ones here are in red. And lo and behold, from about day 11, 12, 13 onwards, they're getting no more recaptures. So our model there was actually quite accurate. Now, that's great, we were stoked. That was a really good outcome for us. But bear in mind, that was a very simple model because these mosquitoes, there's no birth term in that model. And the birth term and the interaction with other mosquitoes are very difficult to model. So it's quite a simple model. We had pretty accurate results, that was great. Um, I've got a few minutes left, but the next bit is, there's only a few more slides, but they're quite complicated. Do we want to... Do we want to, do you, how are you feeling? Do you want to persevere for one more example or, or do you want to ask some questions? I'll, I'll take a vote. <laughs> persevere? Ask questions. Who wants to persevere? Okay, <laughs> persevere, sorry. All right, so um, we've talked about uh, what the community is concerned about and we showed you an example of um, how we calculate possible differences in the capacity of the mosquitoes to transmit different uh, pathogens. Um, we talked about um, the, our ability to predict how long they will last and where they'll spread to. Okay. Um, this slide here is one of the other concerns, uh, we, and we do this for all those kind of concerns. We do multiples of these in the risk assessments. Um, but this one's an interesting one. Um, and first thing I want you to notice is that you see all these question marks through this problem formulation? You remember how I told you how these little arrows talk about what we know, and these question marks are hypothetical linkages. So this is something which um, is one of those concerns. It's like, oh, yeah, that's possible, but blimey, how would that occur? We've never seen that previously. We're not sure how to model that. Um, and this is unanticipated spread and positions of the transgene. So what we were looking at here is you have these transgenic mosquitoes, and they're all supposed to be sterile. Okay, so when you release them, um, 
the all sterile, so the, gen, the genetic construct is not going to be passed on to any of their offspring. So when those 6,000 you release die, that's it. This, the transgene is gone from the environment. Well, this part of the assessment is going, well, is there a way that might go wrong? Could that actually, um, could, could, you know, could there be something which would, would, could occur so that it wouldn't disappear? So they would, they would persist for much longer than we would predict. And the first one is a very simple one, is that um, they're still sterile, um, but for some reason, when we raised them in the laboratory and released in the wild, they had this enhanced fitness. They were just better than the wild type mosquitoes. You know, they were better biters, or their transmission efficiency was different, or they were just, they were better at mating. They were just stronger mosquitoes. Um, now, they would still, they would still die and eventually disappear, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't die anywhere near as quickly as that model that we showed you previously predicted. Okay, so that would be unanticipated. That would be something we'd be concerned about. Um, but we know we're not sure about that. But we know if we change some of the fitness parameters in the model, like, so if we change what we thought was going to happen in that model, we could make them predict for, for, persist for a lot longer than 12 days. These bits down here in the, uh, in the figure are saying, well, okay, what happens if they still have the equal or smaller fitness in the wild type mosquitoes? So they're not super mosquitoes in any way. You know, they're not, they're not strong or any fun. Um, but we've created this transgene here. Um, what happens if that doesn't behave the way we believe it behaves? What happens if that starts to behave like a uh, starts to behave like a gene drive? Now, I told you about this X shredder, this construct that was can, uh, can shred uh, the X chromosome in sperm. Now, that shredder is usually on an autosome. Can you take a guess at what would happen if I took that X shredding construct? and somehow it moved to the Y chromosome of mosquito. What would happen then? Just think about it. You've got a construct, a genetic construct, which is cutting the X chromosome in sperm, creating Y-bearing sperm. If it was on the Y chromosome, what would that mean? Can you take a guess? Something that's creating Y-bearing sperm on the Y chromosome. Yeah, it would spread like a gene drive, right? It would, it, would, it would spread like wildfire because you're creating Y-bearing sperm with something which is on the Y chromosome. So every, every offspring has Y-bearing sperm and every offspring has the construct. That's, that's like a cut and copy system. That's like a gene drive. Um, that's actually known, that's known as myotic drive or Y drive. And there are examples, very, very rare examples of that occurring in nature for a limited amount of time. But there were, um, Hypothetically, it is possible there are genetic processes, genes do get shuffled around the genome occasionally. Um, uh, there are ways that that could happen with this construct. Um, and so that's something that we looked at. Um, and that's, that's what this box here is showing, is that the construct drives, the driving force is higher than any fitness cost it imposed, and the construct spreads by a Y drive. A Y drive or home, and there's other mechanisms too, but Y drive is the, is the easiest to explain. And that could then say, well, actually, you release these sterile mosquito hells, but you know, this thing is spreading like wildfire. Um, so that's something we're really concerned about. Um, and there's one other approach here, uh, which is um, an infection with a thing called Wolbachia, which is a, a Wolbachia is an intercellular bacteria which infects mosquitoes and is passed on um, to their offspring in, in, in a way which is higher than Mendelian ratios again. And so if Wolbachia acquired this construct somehow, then it was spread through them with Wolbachia. Um, and that's a whole different story. It's probably a whole new talk as well. Um, but anyway, this, so this is the sort of conceptual modeling stage, trying to figure out well, what might go wrong with this system and then trying to lay this out in this fashion um, and then saying, well, okay, what am I going to measure in this system here? How am, I going to, how am I going to see whether this actually could occur in nature? And these are the ways we, we look at this through in this uh, blue blocks here. Now, how we attack this problem is, is much more difficult than what we've done previously. I'll, I'll go over this very, very quickly, um, but we use a technique called fault tree analysis. This technique was designed back in the 1960s to figure out what might go wrong with um, intercontinental ballistic missiles. So um, when, when intercontinental ballistic missiles, when the Minuteman II missiles were to be developed in the US, they had very complex launch systems. And the US really wanted to know if, if uh, Third World War broke out and we pressed a button to launch our nuclear missiles, what was the chance we pressed the button and nothing happened? Right, because they had this complex engineering system, which had never been tested before. There's no operating history. So they designed this way of breaking down that system into its component parts and looking at how each of those components might fail. We use something similar 
Here we've applied that similar to a very complex system, but in this case it's a biological system. Um, and we look at ways, these are all the different ways, that diagram I showed you earlier now has been broken down into this thing called a fault tree, which are these events separated by these OR gates, which are these little symbols here, and these AND gates, which are these sort of round symbols there. And what an OR gate means, if there any of these events underneath it occurs, then the event above it occurs. And what the AND gate means is that all the events underneath it have to occur for that event above it to occur. So a way of using a thing called Boolean logic to break down a, a, a system into, okay, if this has to occur, what other bits have to fail first? And do they have to fail? Can any one of them fail and this event occurs? Or does, do things have to fail in parallel? Um, that's a way of thinking about the system and breaking it down. We use that technique um, and we ask experts, once we break it down, we break it down to these sort of base level events. We ask experts about the base level events. We use the same elicitation you saw previously. We put it into the fault tree, some calculations behind it from associated Boolean logic, and then we can build up these, these results here. And these are results for this, the, that, uh, that, spread, that problem formulation showed earlier. Um, and we did that with people with Tiger malaria. We also do with independent scientists, so scientists with nothing to do with tiger malaria. And one of the things we look for, for example, is the separation between these red lines and blue lines. So, you know, you know the experts given us, you know, results which are deliberately looking really good. You know, is there any sense of um, a bias in the expert response? In this case, uh, thankfully, there wasn't any. Um, and we plot the results up, and in this case here, this is just a human distribution function for that, uh, for that event. And what that means is um, there's a 50% chance of that event occurring at about a rate of 1 times 10 to minus 10. And there's a 95% chance, that it, or a 5% chance, it might occur at a rate as high as about 1 to 10 to the 6, so 1 in a million. So we were able to make these estimates of how this quite complex system might occur based on this technique. Okay, that really is it. I think that's about an hour before I'm up here overrun. Um, I just want to say this is the acknowledgement. This is the team I lead in, in, in Hobart. So uh, these are the modelers and statisticians involved. This is where a lot of the hard work gets done by. Um, and here's the references. You can have access to those. And uh, thank you very much. Could the system work for other invasive, more complex species like, for example, canto? Uh, in theory, yes, John. So in theory, it will work with any sexually reproducing organism. Um, there are some important caveats to that, though. Um, so uh, the system relies on a whole bunch of stuff which I haven't talked about. So it relies, for example, on you being able to... So you can create the... Um, you can create the... You, if you know the genome, you can say, okay, there's a genome, there's a gene which is really important, like double sex, for example, or those inverted terminal repeats from the X chromosome, they're really important. If I can disrupt them, I know I can disrupt the life cycle. I can make them all male, I can make them sterile, I can do those things. So that bit is getting incredibly easy now because we, we can sequence genomes now very, very quickly. So we could do, we, the cane toad sequence has undoubtedly been done already. And because CRISPR is, is so quick and so accurate, so okay, there's a sequence, I just need to create a guide in RNA which looks like that, no Cas9, do the current copy, I know that's going to work. Um, that bit's the easy bit. The hard bit is saying, okay, I have to turn the whole system on. Okay, so I, I glossed over how that system actually works in practice, right? So in those gene sequences, you have the CRISPR Cas9 bit, you have the homology arms I talked about. Upstream of that, you'll have things called promoters, right? And those are the things that turn on the CRISPR Cas9 system, right? Now, Knowing how to turn a gene on in an organism is not an easy task, and you have to turn it on the right part of the life cycle. So we talked about as spermatogenesis, when sperm are being produced, turning on this system that cuts the X chromosome. So that knowing the gene that works when you're producing sperm, that turns on genes downstream of it, that knowledge is based on you know decades of research, John. So the bit about, okay, how do I design the guide RNA? You can do that in days. Knowing how to turn that system on when cane toes are producing sperm may still take years, and, and even then it may not work. So uh, the answer is yes, in theory it can work with any sexually reproducing organism, yeah. um, but there's a whole bunch of work that needs to take place to actually operationalize that. So for in, in rodents, for example, in mice, 
I mean, it's only just been shown to work and not very well. Um, so there's a lot of talk about using it for rats and mice, um, but it's, it's many decades behind where they are now with things like insects, because the insects where they started. Yeah. I have one, um, and you might have just answered it, but I was wondering why you don't use this approach with the virus rather than with the mosquito, and is it because the virus doesn't reproduce in the right way? Or yeah, so this yeah. works, the way this works, the cut and copy work, this yeah. inheritance, like viruses aren't sexually reproducing organisms, okay. Justin, yeah, so it wouldn't work against, it wouldn't work against viruses. Um, so this is really about spreading something quickly through yeah. populations of, of sexually reproducing organisms. Yeah. And also to make it, you know, to make it cost effective. So why are they thinking about this mosquitoes and malaria? It's because in theory, you could go around sub-Saharan Africa, releasing you know, hundreds or maybe a few thousand transient mosquitoes, sit back, do nothing, and malaria eradicates itself within a decade. You know, whereas you know, that's an incredibly cheap way to get a massive, a massive impact. So, um, but that's part of the reason why there is something going to be cheap and work is because mosquitoes reproduce really quickly. Mm. They die quickly and they reproduce quickly, Justin. So, you know, in theory, you could do this to get rid of, um, you know, horses or camels in, you know, in the outback, or, you know, um, you could use it for any sexual reproducing organism. But if they reproduce really slowly, then the time taken for this yeah. thing to spread, you know, could be hundreds of years. Um, wouldn't be very effective. Yeah. But something that reproduces quickly, it's very, very effective. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm curious, just repeat the question. Oh, sorry, I've got to repeat the question. Yes, sorry. It's going to be a hard question to repeat, so I don't have it straight in my head. <laughs> um, but with this, you know, you're going and talking to the communities about what you think the risk could be, and we can never think of every potential risk, right? So the risk can never be zero. So how does that come in then when you go back to the community and say, we, we, we want to try this, you know, it, it looks like the risk is really low, but there's always one there. And, People are not always rational creatures saying, oh, this is so long, it's worth doing. You know, how, how do you deal with that perception of, we don't know that, you know? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is about how do we deal with the risks, the, the unknown unknowns, the famous ones, yeah. Um, you can't, basically. The, the bottom line is you don't, you can never be 100% sure that you've identified all the hazards. So all those little diagrams we showed about all the concerns, we can't guarantee that we have thought of everything that might go wrong. It's impossible to do, we can't do that. Um, and at the end of the day, it becomes a risk benefit calculation taken by, not by people like me, but taken by the biosafety authorities in those nations that are, are, um, are considering using it, but ultimately also by the community. Um, now, the other thing I, I haven't talked about is this technology is incredibly contentious. Um, so there are many people around the world who think this research should stop. In fact, there's, there's uh, at the Convention of Biological Diversity run by the UN. Of the last three meetings of that convention, there have been groups, very vociferous groups saying we should stop doing this work. It's dangerous. Um, it's flat out dangerous. We're playing God. We shouldn't be doing it. I mean, each time the, the request for moratorium and research has, been, has, has not been voted through. Um, but it is incredibly contentious for that very reason. As if people say, you can't guarantee to me that something might not go wrong here. And if this thing spreads and has an unintended effect and it continues spreading, how are we going to recall it? How are we going to change it? Um, and it's, you know, it's a valid concern. And it's one of the reasons why um, uh, we are being funded to look at these things on top of other people. So. We are not developing this technology, we have no skin in the game, and we've been asked to look at it because the people who are developing it are also doing their own risk assessments, but people want an independent assessment too. They want, you know, oh, you know we're not sure, we, we, want to, we want to be really sure this is being closely looked at. Um, but yet, yeah, to answer your question, we can't. It's, it's a risk-benefit calculation. You know, do, we, do we take that risk to stop a thousand children a day dying of malaria? Um, it's, it's a community, it's a society choice. Yeah, I mean, mosquitoes, are, I think that first slide I show, I, I kind of glossed over it, but they, it's, it's an interesting slide, you should go back and have a look at it, it says, what's the most dangerous animal on the planet? And, you know, it's, it's mosquitoes followed by humans, like, we're really good at killing each other, mosquitoes are better, you know, not just through malaria, but through dengue and Zika and a whole range of other pathogens, so, yeah, yeah. I've got another question, Keith, and uh, what I'm wondering is, 
is the regulation of this kind of approach to controlling diseases something that's at the national level or is it at the international level? Uh, ultimately, it's at both, Justin, yeah. So um, there is a committee in the World Health Organization that if you want to introduce any new technology to control a disease, um, they, the, this, this committee evaluates each of those new proposals. So, I mean, I should, I should emphasize that genetic control is not the only way to control malaria. And there's a range of other research going on to try and eliminate malaria. There's new vaccines come out recently. It's not as effective as people would hope, but it's still pretty good. Um, there, are, there are other gene drive control technologies that target the parasite. So they don't kill the mosquito, they just make the mosquito unable to transmit the parasite. Um, some people say that's probably safe. Some people say it's safer. There's even people looking at just making the buildings physically mosquito resistant. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole range of different vector control strategies. Um, if you have a new one, Justin, you have to you you know to to, to use it. Um, it has to get this sort of World Health Organization yeah. stamp of yep, we think it's good enough, and it goes through a process, an international process. Um, on top of that is a national process. So to do those releases that transgenic release of the sterile mosquitoes I talked about, mm -hmm. that had to have the permission of the uh, biosafety authorities in Burkina Faso where right. the release occurred. Um, and so, uh, and, and the similar, and genetic, organ genetic modified organisms in general are usually uh, almost without fail, there's a few nations but not many, without fail, well, there'll be national biosecurity laws, biosafety laws. That means that, you know, you'll have to do a risk assessment, you have to make some predictions, you usually have to do a few, few, a few field studies. So there's a national layer. But on top of that, there is also this international um, uh, process that occurs. And as, as, as I mentioned, the Convention on Biological Diversity previously is an international convention, Jocelyn, which, okay. you know, this technology is, is debated right. quite vociferously. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine one advantage of this approach, if it is actually applied, would be that it would be a very, very small cost to the communities where you actually use it. Yep. So they don't have to buy some fancy and it's actually tools just, or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't have to buy anything yeah. and they don't have to change their behaviour. Yes. That's the other important aspect. Yeah. Um, so bed nets are really, insecticide treated bed nets are, are being part of the reason why those uh, death rates were diminishing drastically in that first slide I, I showed you. Um, but the uh, mosquitoes becoming resistant now to the insecticide in those nets. But you also have to use the nets. Yes. You know, and, and so if you forget to use it or, you know, it gets a hole in it, you don't maintain it. So money and human behaviour are two things yes. are hard to come by. Mm -hmm. um, and so this relies on neither of those, yes. Justin, to you. That's why it's potentially very cost effective. Yes. Mm -hmm. Take advantage. Yeah. Any, yes, please, Eva. Um, well, um, I know that the, only the female anopheles um, mosquito transmits, mm -hmm. but does the male one also carry the virus? No, because the males don't, the males don't bite, so... Yeah, I know, but they don't bite, but would they have in their body... No, no, so the, the mosquito picks up, um, picks up the plasmodium parasite from a human during a blood meal. Um, and so... It, it, it's human, mosquito, mosquito... Human to female mosquito, female mosquito to human. Yeah, so it's only females that transmit, because um, they're the only ones who take a blood meal. Yeah. Um, and so I did have a slide in there earlier which showed the life cycle, it's quite complicated, I thought I'd skip that, yeah. Um, so if you can create all males, not only do you diminish the population, but the number of bites will go down as well. Or, and that's the other reason targeting double sex, is that the females can no longer bite. So you could kill all the humans who have malaria? <laughs> that would be the other way to do it, Justin, it would be to kill the human population, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, yeah we, we're quite good at that. Might um, have a limited appeal, actually. Yeah, yeah not, <laughs> not quite as attractive, yeah. Sorry, I haven't turned that off. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's, yeah. <laughs>